Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse and welcome to the 6K Q&A answering video <laughs> versus the announcement video. Man, this is gonna be a video. So thank you to everyone who submitted a question. Full disclosure, I have not looked at the questions. So I looked and I saw that people had left comments, but I wanted to be able to answer them kind of off the cuff. And not that I was gonna script responses, but since I tend to be in my head a lot, I knew that I definitely was going to start to formulate answers because I can't help myself. So that's the plan. And then I also had the moment of what if they're not actually a lot of questions and <laughs> this becomes a very short slash embarrassing video. So buckle up, get a drink. We're going to give it a go. I've never done a Q&A before, so here we go. <laughs> Let's do this. Okay, so I'm just going to read from top down and let's see, let's see what we've got cooking here. Okay, so question number one. First off, let me back up for half a second. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question. Thank you to everyone who's ever liked, commented, or watched one of my videos. Thank you to everyone who's ever subscribed to one of my videos. Maybe you told a friend. Maybe you got a recommendation out of it. Whatever. Whatever you found here. Thank you for finding it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sticking around. If you're new here, welcome. So I should have started with the big thank you. It's Friday afternoon. My brain is definitely churning. I don't know why I feel nervous. Okay, here we go. Okay, question number one. What do you do for a full-time job aside from YouTube? Yes, YouTube is <laughs> no way my full-time job. <laughs> no way my full-time job. Dreams. I, I, feel, I feel like Chandler Bing where I've got like one of those jobs that's like hard to describe. So I started, well, I mean, if you like really want to go back in time, not like I went to school for magazine journalism, originally photojournalism, eventually magazine journalism. And it's really hard to find a job writing that pays money. So I wound up taking a temp job. There is a point to the story. I took multiple temp, job, temp jobs, but I had a long-term temp, temp job, long-term temp job in commercial real estate. I went to school in Boston. I stayed in Boston, which is part of where the writing thing didn't happen the way I thought it would. But anyway, so I wound up getting hired full time. The plan was to do it for like a year, make some money, have some insurance, figure it out. And it just became a career. So I was the manager. So for multiple buildings throughout my career in Boston, I worked for the same company. We got bought out, we bought out other companies, so it continued to grow. But basically when you're the commercial property manager, you are responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the building, which is everything from how it looks, how it feels, like, is it hot? Is it cold? Is it clean? Is it secure? You were dealing with all of the tenants. You are dealing with construction. You are dealing with leasing. So you have an arm and everything. And then there's experts in all of those different fields and everybody works together and you get it done. And it was something I didn't even know existed as a job. I wound up falling into it and loving it. I had the great fortune of having a lot of really great mentors, a lot of really great people to take me along on this path who were happy to teach me things. And I really found a groove in it. So I wound up transferring with my firm to New York, came to New York City eventually. I'm from New York originally. And our company got sold, did not go into good hands. So I decided to reassess and I wound up coming in-house. So rather than being the person who ran the building, I became the person who ran a company's office. So I became like the facility director, the office administrator, whatever you want to call it. And I worked for several companies doing that. So again, you're doing everything to manage the day-to-day -day operations of an office. And it has done, it's everything from, I've done HR, I've done hiring, I've done construction, I built out two offices. You're doing everything from making sure there's coffee beans to making sure that when a VIP client shows up, everything is organized. I've got, I've had a chance to do a lot of really cool stuff. And eventually I got really, really burnt out and was looking for a change and had a job, did not work out. And now currently, whoop, <laughs> I'm working for a company who it's like technically like, I feel like the titles don't relay anything. Basically, I work on a team where we work for a dedicated client across North America and my company manages all the facilities operations of their offices. And what I do alongside my boss, we're pretty lean, 
is we are doing all of the vendor management, all of the contracts. We are dealing with like savings and budgets. And it's just, it's like a hard to describe sourcing, innovation, transformation, vendor management, client relations. I get to wear my real estate hat. I get to do a lot of stuff that I enjoy. I am 100% remote, which I love big time. And it's just a lot of a lot. So I'm one of these people who kind of like does all the things. I don't like to be bored. And that's what I do. I feel like Chandler. There's finance. I feel like there's so many. It's like, I feel like it's just like all the things. Get to do all of the things. But I really enjoy my boss. I work with some really wonderful people. And hopefully I'll be here for a long time. So that's what I do for work. <laughs> that probably didn't answer your question. And then this is also asking to do a day in the life. So I'm trying to vlog a bit more. I will see how a day in the life goes. I'll be honest, a lot of it is me just sitting at a computer on Zoom calls and working in spreadsheets and working in databases and talking to vendors and doing stuff in PowerPoint, but never say never. I mean, maybe, maybe, that I, maybe I could turn it into something interesting. So putting a pin in that. I feel like that was a question I cannot answer directly today, but I would like to do better vlogging. So there you go. Next question, how is your writing going? <laughs> I was just messaging somebody, a, another author on Instagram, and I was just saying how I have like the worst mental block and I know exactly what it is, which makes it doubly frustrating. So I was on a really good streak. I'm still in my second draft. I am a pantser. I have so much work to do. There is such a heavy lift that is needed in this draft and I know it. And as much as I'm just trying to see the chapter in front of me, I can't not see, I don't even know how many chapters are in this book. I can't not see 300 pages ahead. And it is completely, I'm psyching myself out and it's completely shutting me down. So it's not going well and I can't seem to break through it. And I know all I need to do is sit down and write for 10 minutes. And I, when I tell you I will do anything to avoid writing for 10 minutes, I mean anything. It's not good. It's not good. I'm not in a good creative space right now. And I feel generally stunted creatively across the board right now. I'm still targeting like October 15th to have this draft done which is really aspirational. Like I really need to get to work, but it's there. I don't want to abandon ship. Like the story is there. I have ideas. I know what I need to do. I just can't seem to break through it. So it's not good. It's not good, Holly. It's not good. <laughs> okay. Second question from Holly is book recommendations for each place that you've lived. Well, for Boston, I'm always going to recommend Peter Swanson. The Kymerth killing takes place in and around Boston. It's a, it's, there's some suburban Boston to it. It also goes to Maine, but he is a Boston, Boston adjacent author. So The Kymerth Killing by Peter Swanson is one of my all-time favorite books. And then The Kymerth Saving, which is the sequel, came out last year, which I also really enjoyed. The Woman in the Library by Sulari Gentile is also a really fun Boston book. So that one is Boston proper and you are like at the Boston Public Library and you are in the South End. I lived multiple places around Boston, but the last place I lived was in Back Bay. And I lived like right near Newbury Street and I just loved that part of town. It's one of the things I miss the most about Boston. And it was a really, really, really good book. I'm sure I can think of other ones. And then, which when I'm editing this, I might pop up other books. And then for New York, man, I mean, for New York suburbs, We Are the Brennans by Tracy Lang takes place in and around kind of where I grew up and what I know. Some of it is like a fake town. Great family story, loved it. Everything was great about it. Her new book, The Connollys of County Down will be out by the time you guys see this. That also takes place kind of in a similar area in Westchester, and I also very much enjoyed it. Laura Dave's book, London is the Best City in America, also takes place in Westchester, which is where I'm from. And I loved that book so much. So there's a lot of familiarity to that. And they also go to New York City. I feel like I know that there should be better thrillers, and I'm not thinking of them off the top of my head. I mean, Lock Every Door by Riley Sager takes place in New York City 
and what's the Dakota, but isn't the Dakota, but is the Dakota. So that's a good one if you want a thriller. And I loved Emily Giffen's Something Borrowed, which takes place in New York City. I read that forever ago when it came out, when I discovered her. That's another New York, like, based in New York book. And why am I blanking on thrillers? Maybe I'll think of something as I film. I mean, for the love, New York City, come on. My mind is a blank trap. I'll come back to it. I will post stuff over here for New York. And then your last question, the most anticipated release for the second half of 2023, hands down, is Midnight is the Darkest Hour by Ashley Winstead. Not only will I do anything to avoid writing, I would do anything to get an arc of this book. I <laughs> got rejected on NetGalley. I begged her publisher. I've entered all the contests. It's pre-ordered. It's coming. It's not, it's not that I'm not going to buy it. It's that I want it immediately. And I'm jealous of every single person who has access to it. So do not talk to me on October 3rd because I'm going to have my nose in that book. You bet. You bet. You bet. You bet. Okay. Okay. Next question. Have you always been a big reader or did you just get into reading within the last, the last few years? And if you've always been a reader, what's the first book you remember loving and inspiring you to read more? So I have always been a reader. I had the great fortune of having a mom who would take me to the library, who hugely encouraged reading. We had tons of books in our house always. My dad is a reader, not in the same way. My mom was an English teacher at one stage, but reading has always been in my world. We used to get to go and borrow books, you know, like we would go to the bookstore and get books. And I've always, always been a reader. It has wavered where like there are times where I was reading, you know, even in college I would read for fun, but there are definitely times where maybe I was reading like one or two books a month versus now maybe I read like eight books a month. So it's, it's come in waves, but always been a reader. And then the first book I remember reading and loving and inspiring me to read more. I mean, I was always devouring books. I loved series or I would always dive into like one writer. So I used to read all the Judy Bloom books. I remember reading, it's funny, like I didn't really read Nancy Drew, but we read the Bobsy Twins and I don't know why we read the Bobsy Twins, but I remember reading the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil Lee Frankweiler. I used to read like any kind of picture books I always enjoyed, but when I got into middle school, I feel like Sweet Valley High. And that's when I was reading the Lois Duncan books. Like I know what you did last summer and Stranger with My Face. And those always really excited me. So I was always reading something. I started reading Agatha Christie. I feel like maybe eighth grade. My dad had had some of those. And I'm trying to think if there was like a big book in high school. Catcher in the Rye completely blew me away. I loved that book. I was obsessed with it. I actually wrote a paper about my physical copy of the book. <laughs> just obsessed, obsessed. So yeah, I've just always, always, always enjoyed it. Always been surrounded by books. Always had the luxury and the privilege of having books around me, but spent a lot of time at the library. A lot, a lot of time at the library. So, uh, okay. Next question. Have you had anything published prior and what are you currently writing? So somebody, thank you, Regina said, I can't wait to read your book. I can't wait for you to read it either. Someday it's going to get done. I have not been published as a writer. Like I haven't written, a, I haven't published a book. I have, I published articles in like my college paper a couple of times. I had, I was the, one of the editors of my high school paper. <laughs> I'm counting it because it's a byline. So help me. But no, I have not been. So I have completed three books. The book I'm working, three books. Isn't that awful? Yeah, three books. So I, and then the one I'm working on now, and I have a bunch of abandoned ship books also. So I have queried, I have had publishers ask me for partials. I have had publishers ask me for manuscripts. Um, I have had complete crickets to query letters. I have done Asian events where you called pitch fest, where you go in and you pitch your book. So I haven't lost hope yet. It's very discouraging. It's very challenging. I would really like to see my book on a shelf. Every time I read somebody else's thing in Publishers Weekly, when they post on Instagram, I get so excited for them. And then I get so like, get it together, Audrey, like this could be you if you could get it together, girl. So I am writing a thriller. I'm going to bucket it under that umbrella. 
I feel like it's probably going to land in like psychological suspense, but for the sake of big old genre, it's a thriller. I'm far too superstitious to say anything else about it. I will say we've got dual timelines. We've got two different locations and people die because it's that kind of a thriller. So stay tuned, stay tuned. Next question. Do you almost always enjoy the books you read or do you normally just not talk about books you don't like? <laughs> this is so funny. <laughs> I was just having a conversation with someone the other day because I was talking about a book that I didn't really enjoy and I'm not going to say it here and I'm not trying to be cryptic. I'm just not, I'm not here to negatively talk about somebody else's book just because it didn't work for me. But I was saying like, I didn't know how to handle a book I didn't really enjoy and just wound up not reading it and like nothing's going to come of it or anything like that. But I know that there are reviewers who, if they don't enjoy a book, they just don't talk about it. So I have not not talked about a book. I don't think ever since I've started this channel. I don't think there's a book I've read that I've completed that I haven't talked about. I really don't think there is. I have certainly started and stopped books. I know I've talked about DNFs before. And a lot of the times it's just that like I couldn't get into it or it didn't work for me versus like there was something inherently wrong with it. And I feel like that's usually the case where it just wasn't working for me. But I do, I try to talk about books constructively all the time. If there was something in it that didn't work for me, I'm not here to shade a book. I'm not here to shade an author. I'm not here to like crap all over somebody's work. I find no joy in that. I have definitely in my early days done like worst books of the year, most disappointed. And I've just sort of veered away from that because I just don't find that I'm interested in doing those kinds of videos anymore. It's just, it's subjective. I, I have a writer hat on a lot of the time where I think like, man, like I don't want to be out there like saying negative things about people for sport. Like it just doesn't do anything for me. So I have definitely read books that I haven't enjoyed and like not every book. I was just saying the other day to somebody else too, like I am so desperate for a book that like blows my socks off. I have had some like good reads. I've had some like really good reads, but I have not been like just like completely blown away. And I really, 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 really desperately want to be blown away. But I don't, I mean, I don't always enjoy them. I can usually find something in a book that I enjoy. If I can't find anything in a book that I'm enjoying, I'll just stop reading it now. I used to just work my way all the way through it. I would not DNF. I'm a better DNFer now, but a lot of times I'm still like curious to see how it's going to end. So I'll stick with a book. And if I have committed to reading a book or if I'm lucky enough to get an arc, like I always want to see it through. But I think if it was something I really didn't like, I might not talk about it going forward. I don't know. And I mean, I'd have to like really have an issue with it in some way or another, but I'm not going to just tear a book apart for fun. And I know I've done it in the past and like, ew on me. I'm not proud of me for doing that. Not proud of me. Okay. Next question. What did you go to school for? Where did you grow up? And what did you want to be as a child? So I answered this earlier in, in, in the book, <laughs> I answered this earlier in the video. I went to school for magazine journalism. I originally was going to do photojournalism. I was very much into photography. I still am, but like I took photography courses. I'm the girl who went to summer school for fun because my mom wanted me to have more activity. <laughs> she actually wanted me to take SAT courses so I could get my numbers up. This is between junior and senior year in high school. And we made a deal and I was like, I'll go to summer school if I can pick the classes. So I took a writing class and I took a photography class and I loved them both. And I wound up, I'd always enjoyed journalism. I had a fantastic journalism teacher in high school. And she is the one who recommended to me that I put BU on my list. She was a BU grad. She actually was one of my recommendations. So I wound up going there. I did magazine journalism and my goal was always to write. My goal, my plan was I was going to go to Boston, come back to New York, and I was going to work for Sassy or Mademoiselle or 
I'm trying to think, I don't, or Jane, because Sassy went away, or Glamour, like that was always my master plan. And it just, I didn't want to leave Boston. I loved it so much. And I had a really hard time finding a legit writing job there. I had unpaid internships. I worked at a magazine in Boston and eventually had to get a real job. So that was my plan, I would say. And when I was a kid, um, so I grew up outside of New York. I grew up in a suburb of New York in Westchester County, which is north of New York City. And I found when we were doing like a big cleaning in my parents' house, I had written a like this is your life kind of a thing. And at the time I wrote this, I wanted to be a tennis player. I definitely was into tennis as a kid. I liked to dance. I liked to sing. I very much, I never like wanted to be in entertainment, but I used to enjoy those things. But then as I got older and got far more self-conscious and somehow stopped enjoying that kind of stuff, like when we did our like plays in high school, which I enjoyed, I was always on the building and running crew. So I was always behind the scenes. So this is like therapy talk, which we could get into on a whole different day. But there was a part of me that always wanted to write. And that was always an interest of mine. And that's kind of what I focused on. So it never occurred to me to do what I actually do for a living. And oddly enough, like, cause my mom had worked, my dad's an architect. There was like a blip in the map where like, I thought maybe I would be an architect. My mom has had a lot of different jobs. She worked in publishing at one point. She worked in our school district. I used to go to the office with her sometimes. I thought it'd be super cool. I used to love that movie nine to five just to work in an office, but I wasn't quite sure like what that meant. But writing has always been there somewhere, somewhere, someday, someday. Okay, another writing question. So hearing about more about my process, am I a planner or a pantser? I am 100% a pantser. I am a discovery writer. I'm trying to think what um, Meg Gardner, I think it's Meg Gardner maybe who calls it discovery writing or it might be Lisa Unger, but like I am someone who has to write her way into a book. I can't plot it. I can't plan ahead. I know snippets. I know characters. It is not a recommended way to write in my book, but I don't know how else to write. It's just, it's how my brain functions. So what I try to do is after I have gone through a few drafts, then try to plot stuff out because eventually you need to fine tune a lot of things, but it's a really un <laughs> non recommended, not a great process. I hesitate to even call it a process. I am a pantser till the cows come home big time. So publishing goals are to get my book on the shelf. I would love to be traditionally published. I would love to see my book in bookstores. My dream scenario is like, I am on a panel at Thriller Fest. I am doing a sit down at Murder by the Book. I am at Poison Pen Bookshop being interviewed. I am just talking about writing, connecting with people about books. Like absolutely my dream would be to have like a Jennifer Hillier, Ashley Winstead, Riley Sager kind of a career and have it be a full-time job. And ugh, I would love it as I sit here and tell you guys that I cannot get out of my own way and finish my book. But those are my goals, dreams. So how far along am I in the editing writing process? I'm calling it second draft. But what I will say to you guys is that this book has been through so many different iterations. This book's been around for a while. This is, we're talking years in the shame cycle. And this is part of the pantsing problem. So it has changed so many different ways from where it was originally to where I am now. I keep changing things because I keep thinking of different things or something's not working. So I think, I'm knocking on my hardwood floor, where I am now is the story it's going to be. I think I have figured out like big bads. I have figured out secrets, which is not to say that some more won't come during the way, but like the core characters have been locked in. I have changed them so many times. I had more, I had less, I had different timelines. I had different things happening in the past. The secrets were different. The lies were different. Like everything has changed so much. The points of views have changed of, of who is telling the story in the book. But I think what I have now is it. Now it's just a matter of turning it into a story. So in the pantsing vein, not only am I a pantser, I also don't write linearly. <laughs> So you can imagine the cluster it is to try and pull this together. It's bad. It's really bad. Like my process is not 
not a process and not something I would recommend, but I don't know how else to do it. And I have tried other things. I've tried to storyboard. I've tried to plot stuff out. I've tried whiteboards. I've tried post-it notes. I've read the books. Like I just, I can't, I can't change who I am. So this is, this is where we're at. So hopefully we'll get to the end of draft two by Nano. That is a goal. That is a goal. Okay. Next question. This thing keeps jumping back to the top on me. What do I do for a living? And is it always what I wanted to do? So not what I always wanted to do, but once I discovered, well, what I'm doing now is what I want to be doing now. So I will say what I was doing, one of the things about commercial real estate and about being the person who runs the office, whatever you want to call it, is you are on site, you are 24 seven. If there is an emergency, I didn't even talk about dealing with building emergencies, floods, fires, I was in a building when our electrical system exploded because of a flood. I have never been more terrified in my entire life. Any crisis you can think of, like 9-11, I was in Boston when it happened. It was one of the second most terrifying times in my life in a building. And I realized I was in Boston, not New York, but there was a lot of unknowns at the beginning, especially because planes were leaving Boston. I don't need to tell you guys this stuff. We hosted the Democratic National Convention. So you get to deal with Secret Service, you get to deal with security, but you also have like dogs and guns and like all this kind of stuff going on around you. Like there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of pressure dealing with celebrities dealing with police. One of the last places I worked in Boston was a public and private facility. It was like a multi-use facility and booze cruises because it was on the Boston Harbor. Booze cruises used to come in, obviously they would leave from there and come back from there. And a lot of people, as you can imagine, would get stupid on a booze cruise. So the police would be waiting for them when they got off the boat so they could arrest them and deal with them. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> so anytime the cop showed up on site, I would get a phone call. So when I tell you my phone would ring all hours of the night, seven days a week, you're on vacation, you get calls, like there's just no escaping it. It is an all consuming kind of a job. And I have really, really wanted to get away from that for a really long time. And it was very hard for me to break out of that. And the job I have now, so I was trying to transition at my last company. I was able to transition in my last company, but then it was not a good company. The job I have now, I'm very lucky that my boss kind of found me from a slush pile of resumes and saw something in me saw my background and it has worked out tremendously because I have been trying to pivot for a really long time and had a very hard time of having someone take me seriously. So it's really good. So I'm doing what I want to be doing now and writing on the side, writing on the side. So I have another one, which is just a comment where it says, I miss the vlogs where she walks around the neighborhood. I'm trying to get back to those. I, like I said before, I have abandoned so many vlogs. It's just been hard. I'm back to trying to squeeze in walking before my workday starts, which means I'm up really early, which I don't mind because it feels so good to be doing it again, but I'm trying to get back into a rhythm. Honestly, this past month or so in New York, I feel like ever since the Canada fire smoke started here, it's been really bad outdoor air quality. Then it's hazy, it's been humid. We've had these crazy thunderstorms. Like it has not been a great summer for walking, but as soon as I can get back to it on a regular basis, I will, I will be doing that for sure. So don't worry, it's coming back. Okay, what genre is your book? It's a thriller. Next up, somebody just said I get all my recommendations from you. It makes me so happy. Lots of congratulations. Thank you so much. More congratulations, you guys are so sweet. I do say I don't read romance, but then I totally read romance. I don't, I'm telling you, when I read Beach Read, it was like it reopened a door that I had closed somewhere along the way. And I feel so grateful, I was just, I'm actually simultaneously filming, filming a vlog as I'm doing this, but I started reading Don't You Forget About Me by Vari McFarlane. So I heard about her on the Bad on Paper podcast and she is like a UK Emily Henry, I would say. So the author herself is from Scotland. The book is so funny. The humor is so on point and I'm just loving, I'm loving romance that is weightier that has more to it than just just the romance i need more than just the romance like i need other things going on so if there's some weightiness to it i'm in and i'm also like i read a book recently where i was like where is my open door <laughs> scene where, where is my open door romance scene i need it i need it okay Okay, net more Boston questions. So Boston based book or favorite Boston based author. So I did talk about Peter Swanson. I feel like I need to do better on the Boston. 
again, my brain is just freezing. I do love him so much. I was looking at, I think it was Lisa Unger's Instagram lately, and she is up in Boston. So like Hank Philippi Ryan is in Boston. Kara McManus is a Boston author. There's definitely like a group of Boston people. Um, Caroline Kempness is from Cape Cod originally. The fourth book in the Joe Goldberg series is set at Harvard in and around Boston. So like they're in Southie, they're in Boston proper, um, and they're over in Cambridge. So that's a good one, but it is book four in the series. So that's a series where I really feel like you do need to read them all to have it make sense because there's so much reference to stuff that happens before, but that's a great one. But I'm going to keep brainstorming on Boston books. And okay. Next up, how has your reading taste changed in the last several years? So definitely more open to romances. And not that I was ever anti. I think, like I had been reading Emily Giffen. I'd been reading Marion Keys. I'd been reading Jennifer Weiner, which wasn't really romance per se. But I really feel like Emily Giffen and Marion Keys, and Marion Keys in particular, like had romance but had the weightiness to it. And I don't know... When, I mean, like, I was reading Bridget Jones, I was reading early Lisa Jewell, which was all of that British rom-com, just all of that, like, 20-something, early 30s, finding your way, figuring out your life. I just loved all that stuff. And I don't know when I made a harder pivot. It wasn't intentional. It wasn't deliberate. I think I just started gravitating towards other books. And I'd always been reading my Patricia Cornwells. I'd been reading John Grisham for a long time. And Gone Girl definitely was part of it. But yeah, it wasn't deliberate. So I do feel like I've been better being a little open to books that I normally wouldn't have read before. And I say open in the sense of I was not actively like before booktube, before I knew booktube existed, because I obviously watched it before I started doing it. I was not getting exposure to new books, I would go to bookstores, I would roam, I would look for stuff in, you know, that was recommended in books and magazines and stuff. And I definitely would find things just browsing a bookstore, but booktube definitely opened me up like Beartown, which I've talked about. I read because of booktube, Evelyn Hugo, I read because of booktube. Those are two books that I don't know that I would have picked up on my own. That was the first Taylor Jenkins read I read. Obviously that was the first Frederick Bachman I read. And there's definitely books like that, that I would have probably walked right past in a bookstore, but booktube got me into them. So I feel like my taste has, broadened in the sense that I'm more open to hearing about other books and not instantly writing it off because like it's not a thriller therefore I'm not going to read it so I feel like my openness and then I've been reading more YA again which I've enjoyed and it's been a long time since I did that but I definitely got more into it I feel like YA right now is so smart and so well done Obviously not every single one, but what I've been picking up has been really good. And when it doesn't feel... <laughs> Sorry, I've got a timer because I always do. <laughs> I've got to do something. Like, obviously YA is targeted towards a YA audience, but I feel like some YA books have an adult appeal to them, and those are the ones I really enjoy. So I had tried to read Gossip Girl when it was like a thing, and I just couldn't get into it. So I've read more YA lately, too like in the past few years, for sure. Okay, I feel like I might look slightly different. I needed to get some sustenance and I needed to flip my laundry. So, okay, back to the Q&A. <laughs> some more personal life questions. Uh, I feel like you guys have figured out I am not big on the personal share. Again, not trying to be cryptic, just <laughs> personal preference, but I do not have children. I am not married. There you go. More lovely congratulations. Here's another one. You're a pretty positive book reviewer, which I love. Has there ever been a book that really ticked you off for reasons like misogyny, racism, sexism, religion, not being able to separate author from characters? That's interesting. So I'm trying to think. I'm sure back in pre-booktube days, I feel like I've done a pretty good chance, a pretty good chance, a pretty good job of picking books I don't want to say that like I know I'm gonna like because how do you know what's gonna be in between the pages of a book I don't read 
controversial books on purpose like if people are like talking about like there's like something in it that like is going to drive you nuts like I don't gravitate towards that I remember reading a book it was early in my booktube days speaking of like how to talk about a book that you didn't quite enjoy and it was a cozy mystery I can't remember what it was I'd been reading like the Aurora Tea Garden books and it wasn't one of those it was somebody else I don't remember I feel like it was sisters maybe in Vermont or something, but I remember they were talking about the, there was like a police chief in town or whoever, like the head of the police department was a woman. And I remember one of the characters physically describing her as like, like how tight her uniform was and how it strained across her body. And then also there was like a line about like, no wonder she's single, which gross. And I remember talking about it in my review and I feel like it was, like a main POV character who was saying it. So like, I understand and I don't take issue in a book where like you have a character who's supposed to be crappy and who's supposed to be racist or misogynistic or sexist and they are making all of those comments, but it is their character and it's serving the story. But if it is like our main POV character, it feels much grosser to me because to me it's like I'm supposed to be on your side and you're saying things I don't like. I'm also really like repulsed by the fact that you're saying anything about her weight and that like her weight is the reason why she is not married. Just gross. So that one really annoyed me. I'm trying to think about other books. Nothing is sticking out to me because I feel like Things have been said that I find gross, but they are meant to feel gross because the character who's saying it is not someone you're supposed to enjoy. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. The separating author from characters, I know. And I go back to like the AJ Finn and the woman in the window. I read the woman in the window when it first came out. I like went to the book event. I met him. I did all the things. And then all that stuff came out about... Dan Mallory and which is his real name AJ Finn was a pen name which we all knew but things that he had done or had supposedly done and there were a lot of exposés on it which just made me not thrilled like you're always kind of like not jazzed when you hear that kind of stuff about somebody he has not written anything else as AJ Finn I don't know if he's been ghostwriting other books I feel like he's shown up more sort of back in the publishing world again. He's been at Iceland Noir. He's been at Hampton Whodunit. He definitely is in that world still. I don't know if I would pick up another one of his books. I also don't know if he would write another book. I was never on the JK train. If it's a JK question, I never read any of those books. I never read Harry Potter. I never had any interest in any of it. So it's not anything I'm inclined to pick up or would actively search out anything that she writes going forward. I'm trying to think of other authors. I know there's been controversy about other authors, but I have not, I have not found an author who has offended me and then continued to pursue their books or an author who has done something that doesn't feel right with me or doesn't sit right to me and then continue to support their books or, or purchase their books, if that makes sense. Okay, where am I, where am I, where am I? Um, more congratulations, thank you guys so much. I probably should have read some of these in advance. Okay. Hi friends, editing Audrey here. So nobody should be surprised to find out that this video wound up being way, 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 way longer than I ever anticipated. We're talking like almost 90 minutes of raw footage. So I'm gonna chop it up into two pieces. <laughs> you think it would have dawned on me when I was filming it that I'd been sitting there for a really long time. But good news is the video is completely edited. So you're not gonna have to wait very long to see part two of the video. And the other great news is you guys are fantastic and asked a whole bunch of great questions. So tune back in in a couple of days <laughs> for part two. And thank you again to everyone for asking so many questions, for being here, for supporting me. This was so much fun. I don't know why I've never done a Q&A before, but I had an absolute blast. And you're going to have to tune in to see the rest of the questions. So I will see you guys super, super soon in the next video. Bye, everybody.